Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Genevieve, and I um, work with Latham with the asylum. I'm a, one of the asylum coordinators, and I want to thank all of the participants from New York New York Legal Assistance Group for helping to lead this training and the clinic that we're having, and we're really excited. So thank you so much to William, uh, Wilma, <laughs> uh, Melissa, and Allison, um, and I'll be sharing the CLE code at the end. But thank you all so much for joining and. We can kick off the training. Thank you so much, Genevieve, uh, for and Wendy um, and Olivia for working with us behind the scenes uh, to put this training together and the clinic. Uh, my name is Wilma Tamayo. I am the uh, coordinate, clinic coordinator for NILAC. I'm in charge of doing all the uh, limited scope clinics, um, and it, it's for me. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and we are very thankful that you've taken the time to work with us. Um, I from many many years, I never wanted to say that there was an immigration crisis, but going out to the communities in New York, working with so many immigrants, and seeing the huge need that. Uh, we have for uh, legal help, I, I think it is a crisis because when you have at a clinic, you might have, you know, 70 people and you can only provide assistance to 20, you know, 50 people are out there that need help and we cannot provide it. And that for me is a crisis because I cannot imagine being in a foreign country uh, not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, and and not getting the the legal support you need to be safe, and and um, it's a crisis. So I am very thankful that you taking the time to work with us. Um, just a little bit more about NILAC. Uh, and Allison and Melissa will give you all the statistics about the. The, the project that we're working on with you, but I just want to give you an overall um, number. We help thousands and thousands of immigrants uh, in New York, but not only immigrants, we help um, older adult, adults to prepare advanced planning documents. We help people with housing issues. We help uh, parents uh, of a special education and students to get the services they need. We, ha we help cancer patients to get uh, the medical treatment they need. And that for us is very important to work with partners like you. We also do full representations um, cases. So if you, any of you are interested and in Genevieve and Wendy, if you are interested in taking cases for uh, full representation, we also do that and we can send you more information. If you wanna get involved in helping us to find uh, financial resources to help more immigrants. We super open to that. Um, we need the financial um, support in order to do the work that we do. And you can always, uh, my policy at NILAC is, you don't have to knock on the door because my door is always open. So if you need more information about any of the programs we do and how you can get involved, I'm more than happy to um, to provide that information. And I will share my email and you can email me if you have any further questions. I'm going to uh, let Allison and Melissa introduce themselves and kick off this, um, this training. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Chua. I'm the Associate Director of the Immigrant Protection Unit at NILAC. And good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Cutler. I'm the Supervising Attorney of the Pro Se Plus Project in the Immigrant Protection Unit. Um, thank you all so much for joining us, both for today's training and for the Pro Se Clinic that we will be working on together. We are so happy to have your support um, and your attendance at the clinic. As Wilma was just talking about, we have a real need for um, legal services in the community, and we very much appreciate you participating with us. Next slide, please. OK, 
can I do it? I don't think I can. Okay, so just a little bit um, of an overview about what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk a little bit first about who we're seeing um, on the ground in the community and the need for legal services and um, provide some context um, in terms of the programming that we've been providing. And um, part of the services that we've been expanding to, to use to meet the current Quest project, which you will be participating in um, during your clinic with us. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the immigration procedural postures that you may find your clients in or your, your limited scope clients in because many of our clients will bring with them documentation from their crossing over into the United States. And so we wanna give you a sense of the range of documents that you may see and what that really translates into, what does it really mean? Also, so that if you, the person you're working with has some questions about what is this document, what does it really mean, what are my obligations, you can answer those as well. And then we're going to talk very, very, very briefly, I could not stress this more, very briefly, an overview of asylum law. We could spend many hours on this, but we're going to talk a little bit about what the contours of asylum law um, are so that you understand why you're asking the questions in the application and what the important things are to highlight. Then we're gonna talk about the nitty gritty, the actual procedures of what to expect on the day of the clinic um, and how to fill out the form, which is what you'll be there to do. Um, we're gonna talk specifically about tips of how to fill out the I-589. Um, and so at that time, we're gonna ask you to pull up the form and just follow along with us. The more comfortable you are with the questions and what the format is of the, of the form on the day of, the, the smoother this will go. And then we're gonna let you know what happens after the clinic, mostly so you can inform the person you're working with what to expect um, and to anticipate questions that they might have. Okay, so first about the Pro Se Plus project, the PSPP. Um, so as you may be aware, so according to recent data, New York City um, is, the, is one of the top destinations for recently arrived asylum seekers. Um, since the spring of last year, New York City has seen over 100,000 asylum seekers um, in, in New York. Um, most of those that we are seeing are from Venezuela, Nicaragua, Haiti, Cuba, Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. But recently, we are seeing large numbers of uh, newly arrived immigrants coming from Russia, Guinea, Mauritania, and Senegal. And this um, last portion is actually um, one that I want to draw your attention to because many of the asylum seekers that you'll be working with at the clinic are newly arrived asylum seekers from Guinea um, who are uh, who are um, make up a large number of those that we're seeing and are a need a, a community that's in real need of legal assistance and so we're particularly happy um, for you to be joining us um, for a clinic serving this group of um, of particularly vulnerable asylum seekers. Um, I, I just, my screen is showing um, slightly the, the, the slide. I'm not seeing all of it, but I can't tell if that's just me or everyone. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like there's like two black boxes, both in the top, and then there's one on the bottom. Can you see it there? They're slowly going away, and then there's one on the top that's still there. Uh, um, I will keep going. I'll let you so take, a, I'll let you take a look. What I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing and then share it again. again. Just uh, maybe you. that can uh, fix the issue. I'm so sorry. So keep, um, it's okay. I'll keep keep going while we're um, while we're, oh great, thank you, Wilma. So um, just as a for a broader context, um, so nearly fifty percent of those that we are encountering um, have not had healthcare services in the city, and this is notwithstanding long journeys um, that may have been physically tolling, um, a large incidents of violence occurring during. Um, the, the journey to the United States. Um, and notwithstanding all of that, a large portion of individuals have not had healthcare access um, since arriving 
73% of those that we are encountering are, um, have told us that they have trouble paying for basic living expenses and um, about a quarter um, can't access three meals a day and do not have warm clothing, which is a particular need given um, that we're entering into the winter season. And this is this last next bullet is why it's important but less than 7% can find or afford a lawyer to represent them. And virtually all have not been able to access work because of a lack of work authorization. And so thank you again for joining us for this clinic. Um, I just also wanna note um, one thing that you will see in your documents, uh, your review of documents with your clients is that the vast majority of new New Yorkers have been routed into the enforcement process, meaning that they're being both highly monitored by ICE through check-ins or they're already in removal in deportation proceedings or both. And this has resulted in these really long lines that are um, taking place outside of the federal building. Um, and because of that, it has resulted in really large amount of confusion between asylum seekers about their obligations. Should they be checking in with ICE? Should they be going to court? And part of what we're gonna spend time on is talking through how you know what their obligations are. So what's a Pro Se Plus project? Um, this uh, was a collaboration between community-based organizations and legal service providers, including NILAG. Um, together, we aim to empower and mobilize communities with education and support. Um, and what that really means is that um, we are, we are um, planning to meet this increased need through a multifaceted approach that is um, that does center in some ways the application assistance that you'll be helping us with, but also um, creates uh, and delivers robust community education. We do community service supporter trainings like the one we're having today so that you can help asylum seekers more broadly. Um, we screen recent arrivals for a broad range of needs. So in addition to asylum, um, assisting people with um, housing insecurity, but also protections for survivors of traffic and in intimate partner violence, and then per se assistance and representation. Um, one more note before we get into um, the, the substance. Um, next slide, please. Um, so at NILAG, we, and we um, engage in a client-centered trauma-informed approach. And that really means listening, engaging, and understanding the client's position, their goals, and reasoning. Um, respecting their, agent, their um, agency of self-determination and being aware of the impact of trauma on both clients and ourselves. And we'll be talking about trauma a lot today and why one should craft um, questions carefully and limit the amount that you are asking them to recall. And one of the other tenets of client-centered trauma-informed um, lawyering is to ensure accessibility. Again, why pro se clinics of this type are really important to the communities that we serve. So I'm gonna turn it over to Allison to talk about the cases and some of the documents that may be presented to you. Hi, thank you so much. And so I'm just going to discuss a little bit about the immigration um, procedural posture that a number of our clients may be in. So clients may be interacting with one or more of these agencies at a time, and it is not always clear which agency they're currently interacting with. Um, so for example, under the Department of Homeland Security, there's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, CBP, Customs and Border Protection, and USCIS, US Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, essentially, CBP is the immigration agency that is charged to protect our borders, which includes the southern border with Mexico, the northern border with Canada, and any of our airports. ICE is the immigration enforcement agency in charge of um, enforcing our immigration laws within the United States away from a border. And USCIS accepts affirmative applications for relief for, um, for individuals. And then there's also the Department of Justice. And under the Department of Justice, we have the Executive Office of Immigration Review, which is essentially the immigration courts, and the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is the appeals body um, for the immigration courts. Next slide, please. Um, so all of our individuals that we're serving through Pro Se, Pro Se Plus Project have entered the United States through the southern border. Um, and so a number 
after a client enters through the United States and they are detained at the border by CBP, um, there's one of two things that, that could be happening here. Um, one of multiple things that could be happening here. So one of them is upon detention, there will be granted something called humanitarian parole um, under INA section 212D5. And humanitarian parole essentially allows for an individual to enter the United States. It is not a permanent status. It is essentially a permission to enter and reside here lawfully, lawfully for a certain number, um, a certain period of time, an indef um, a definite period of time. Essentially, we're seeing individuals being granted anywhere between 60 day parole um, and sometimes one and up to two years. In theory, this parole can be extended, um, but on the ground, we're not seeing um, extensions really being given. And so the idea is that parole is going to allow an individual to enter the United States and apply for other types of relief, such as asylum. Um, and it also provides them certain eligibility for public benefits while they're here. And it also allows them to um, have a legal entry, which would then make them eligible for adjustment of status in the future through uh, some family members. Not all individuals are being granted humanitarian parole. Others are being just released on their own recognizance and just being allowed to enter the United States and placed in removal proceedings. Uh, essentially, the biggest difference for our clients on the ground and how this is working is humanitarian parole gives them eligibility for public benefits and also eligibility for a work authorization so that they can work lawfully while they're waiting to apply for other types of relief. Um, but when an individual is not granted parole, they will have to wait for employment authorization until after they've filed for um, other types of relief, such as an asylum application. Next slide, please. So ICE and immigration court are not the same. Um, so as I previously mentioned, ICE is in charge of enforcing our immigration laws after you, um, a citizen is already here. And immigration court is essentially um, the, the judicial body that hears uh, removal proceedings. And so anytime an individual is placed in removal proceedings, they're going to be going to immigration court. ICE is going to monitor those um, proceedings throughout the pendency, certainly for our clients. So many of our individuals are given both ICE check-in dates and court dates once they're at the border, or they're told that they will be receiving a court date and that they have to contact ICE upon arrival in their des um, destination and make an appointment with them. Most of our clients um, are very confused as to what the difference between these two bodies are, of course. They're be dealing with them all at the same time. No one's properly explaining the difference between those two agencies at the border when they're having contact with immigration. Um, and so it's very easy to mix the two. But essentially, ICE does not have the authority to deport an individual unless an immigration judge an immigration court orders an individual removed after going through um, whatever form of relief that they are applying for. So once an individual, if an individual receives a removal order, then ICE, their ICE officer would be in charge of carrying out that removal. Um, So sorry, just a little tech problems on my end. Um, okay, next slide, please. And so on the immigration paperwork, there will be um, something called an alien number or what we call an A number. This is a unique nine digit number that identifies an individual. Um, it's given to any non-citizen by immigration. So anyone who's had contact with border officials, anyone who's been detained, detained by ICE, or anyone who has applied for any type of affirmative relief with USCIS is assigned an A number. So you'll be seeing this A number listed on all of the documents that have been given to a client. Um, so for example, we provided some sample documents for you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, a sample of a release on recognizance. Um, so as you can see, there's an A number in the upper top right-hand corner next to their name. And for this individual, there's an appointment with ICE, but they do not have uh, an appointment with court yet. And this is something that's called a notice to appear. Anyone who is placed in removal proceedings is going to have this document. This is the charging document. Um, it may be a little difficult to read, but essentially there's their name, their A number, 
And then there's the allegations, the factual allegations as to why they're in removal proceedings. So they are not a citizen of the United States. They are a citizen of X country, and they entered the United States on X state at X location. Um, and then there'll be a, a charge under the Immigration and Nationality Act as to why they are removable. So for example, you're present in the United States without inspection or approval. So once an individual receives this document, that means that their removal proceedings have been initiated. However, in order for them to receive a date with immigration court, CBP or ICE, whichever agency created this document, has to then serve this document on the immigration court. Um, so it's possible that an individual may have this piece of paper, but they are not docketed or calendared in the immigration court system. Um, so this is just a little bit of a close-up. As you can see, there's just certain information that's here. So um, if they're arriving alien, if they're an individual present in the United States without having been admitted. And on the next slide, you can see an example of an appointment notice with um, ICE. Not all of the appointment notices appear this way. Some of them do, some of them do not. Some individuals are told to make an appointment at the board um, once they get into the United States and they'll receive an email with that appointment notice. Um, some of these immigration paperwork can look a little different. So it's important to, um, to just read and make sure, confirm the information that's being indicated on them. So whether an asylum application is affirmative or defensive all depends on whether or not that individual is in removal proceedings. So as I previously mentioned, not everyone with a notice to appear in hand is actually going to be docketed and calendared with immigration court because it's up to CBP or ICE to actually give that paperwork with the court. And then once the court receives that paperwork, they have to place it in their system and schedule them. So if an individual has an NTA, but it has not been docketed, where they do not have an NTA at all. We call that an affirmative asylum application. And that means we have to file their asylum application with USCIS. And when an individual does have an NTA and is docketed and calendared in immigration court, we call that a defensive asylum application. And we must file that asylum application directly with the immigration court who has sole jurisdiction over that application. And so how do you figure out if something is affirmative or defensive? Um, next slide, please. So it's very handy. There's, an, uh, there's a website directly right here, or there's a phone number that you can call. Um, and you should access this website on the day of as you're filling out the first page of the asylum application and just run their A number through it. Um, we check the filing information for each of our clients before the clinic but we never know when a client is going to get docketed in immigration court. So even if we had that conversation with them one or two weeks ago and they were not in the immigration court system, the court could have received their paperwork in the meantime and they could pop up on the day of the clinic. And so it's always important to double check this. And it's also something that I like double checks right before we file as well to confirm the location. All right, and now I'm going to kick it back to Melissa, who will discuss an overview of asylum law. Um, so as we will discuss, NILIVE's um, PSPP staff does a first screen of all of the individuals who will be served in our clinics. Um, we've identified what, proced what procedural posture um, the individuals we are serving are in, and we do a first screen um, and analysis to figure out what potential forms of relief um, they may qualify for. However, as um, we're, we will briefly touch on, um, we want to we want to talk a little bit about asylum law um, in the broad like broad broad strokes of asylum law, so that you understand um, why individuals we've screened we believe should be um, qualified to apply for asylum, but also what to emphasize in the um, applications that you'll be helping them fill out. So just, you know, the basics of asylum and why it's important. Most of you may know this, but it's worth um, repeating. Um, winning asylum confers legal and permanent status. Oh, if you could go back, thank you. Um, and so unlike other forms of relief that individuals may be eligible for, qualifying for asylum means um, you generally, generally speaking, will have permanent status and a path to citizenship. Um, this also means that um, individuals will have protection from removal, so protections from deportation, 
And this is particularly important for the this population of individuals that we're serving because as Allison has talked about and I touched on earlier, almost everybody that we're encountering is being monitored by ICE and is either already in or will shortly be in removal proceedings. And so asylum is the really important protection from being deported from the United States. Winning asylum also means that you can get derivative status for spouses and children who are under 21 years old. And this applies to children and spouses who are both in the United States and outside of the United States. And so may pro provide protection for a group of uh, uh, an entire family who faces removal in the United States or allow for protection for individuals in the United States and, and allow them to be reunited um, with family members who are uh, likely in danger abroad as well. An important part of applying for asylum is that 150 days after you apply for asylum, um, the applicant uh, qualifies for authorization. This is really important because many applications for asylum, not all, but many, may be pending for years and years and years. And so applying for employment authorization allows the individual to work legally and gather some benefits while being in the United States while waiting for their asylum application to be heard. So asylum is governed by section 208 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. We are immigration practitioners, so we refer to the sections in the INA by those sections as opposed to the US code. And so section 208 of the Immigration and Nationality Act is what um, asylum, domestic asylum law is based in. Um, this is humanitarian relief for individuals who have a fear of persecution on account of one of five protected grounds. So race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and or particular social group. And so particular social group um, is where we could spend the most amount of time. This is the area of law that has been most heavily litigated but understand that particular social group can include an, any, a large number of um, articulated groups, including people who are LGBTQI, um, people who are in a family, it can include um, types of gender-based violence and domestic violence. And so it's, it captures a wide group of people who are being persecuted um, for a large number of different reasons. One thing that's important to note, and as you can see here, looking at the, the definition for asylum, asylum is not meant for those who are fleeing poverty or generalized violence. While individuals may flee for a, for a number of reasons, including both poverty and generalized violence for asylum. And so it's important, initially our clients may say as an initial matter, I fled because there were no opportunities or it was violent in the place that I was living. That is okay. It can, they can have mixed reasons for fleeing, but the one reason to highlight or multiple reasons to highlight in an asylum application will be the reason for fleeing on account of one or more of these protected grounds. Um, they must establish um, that they have already and or will suffer uh, physical or psychological harm that's serious enough to be considered persecution. And so the important thing to note here is that while many of our clients have already experienced persecution in their home countries, it's not necessarily, um, that's not required for them to qualify for asylum in the future. You can qualify for asylum based on a fear of a future harm, even if you have not been persecuted in the past. Um, and as we've talked about, it's not for those fleeing general persecution, uh, general violence, and that they have to demonstrate that one of the reasons for persecution is a protected ground. The persecutor in an asylum case can either be the government or an entity that the government is unwilling or able to control. Many of our clients have both. Um, persecution by private actors can absolutely give rise to asylum claims. So this is generally true in cases where um, maybe uh, there's domestic violence, intimate partner violence in a home and the government is refusing to protect them. Or in some cases, as some of the clients that you may encounter during our clinic um, with you, 
um, may identify as LGBTQI and may face persecution by both the government through laws that have been enacted, but also through um, other members of the community who um, the government is from. Importantly, an application for asylum must be filed within one year of entry into the United States. And while there are exceptions to this rule, it makes it um, much harder for an, app, for an asylum seeker to have their application for asylum heard if they file after this one year, as it's a threshold issue. And so their asylum application may not even be heard at all if it is not filed within one year of entering the United States. There are a number of bars to asylum. The first is the one-year filing deadline that we've talked about. But another potential bar to asylum that you may encounter is what we commonly refer to as firm resettlement. This is also um, covered by Section 208 of the INA, 208B2A6. Um, this requires entry into another country and offer and or receipt of permanent status. So the and here is important. Having passed through another country does not necessarily bar one from asylum under the firm resettlement bar only. It requires this offer or receipt of permanent status in order for the firm resettlement bar to apply. An offer or receipt of temporary status does not give rise to a firm resettlement issue. And the length of time that someone spends in a country generally is irrelevant if they have not been offered status, okay? It's also worth noting that even if firm resettlement can be established, there are two exceptions to the rule. There's restrictive conditions. So this is the, where the conditions in the third country are so restrictive as to deny resettlement. Um, and this can include um, uh, threats of persecution by an actor in the third country. It can in involve government policies that limit the right of individuals in the country. And so, for example, we have seen a number of individuals who are asylum seekers from Afghanistan who passed through the country of Brazil um, on their way to the United States. And this was through a visa program that um, Brazil enacted specifically for Afghans to come on kind of humanitarian visas. But when they arrived in Brazil, They were asked to remain just in the waiting room of the airport. Um, they were not given the ability to, um, to support themselves or leave. Um, and so the, even though they technically had a visa that allowed them to enter Brazil and allowed them to remain, the conditions of that entry were so restrictive so as um, to be able to rebut a firm resettlement issue. Um, Another exception to the firm resettlement bar are no significant ties. Um, this is what it sounds like, um, showing that you had no significant ties to the country that offered or gave you status um, to remain. There are um, a number of other bars to asylum that we screen for, um, terrorists, uh, persecutors, criminal issues. Um, they should not arise in the cases that you're encountering, but they're just worth noting um, that there are separate bars to asylum for those who um, may be um, considered terrorists under US law, um, may be um, considered persecutors. So one instance where this may arise is um, an individual who may have served time in the military and committed a persecutory act during that time in the military, or maybe served in a government and during that during the time with the government um, act, acted as a persecutor in their way and uh, through their through their uh, occupation. Um, criminal issues also um, may be criminal uh, convictions or other contact with law enforcement, either here in the United States or abroad. And so you will see in the um, application for asylum, there are a number of questions that get to these bars we, when you get to the question of whether or not someone has ever had um, any contact with law enforcement, please remember to note that it is both, it encompasses both here, the United States and outside of the United States. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Allison to talk a little bit about the specific clinic procedures um, for the day of the clinic. 
Okay, thank you, Melissa. Um, so on the day of the prior to the clinic, um, NILAG has robustly pre-screened clients for relief. We have already identified potential claims and potential defenses to deportation that they may qualify for, including asylum. Um, we've identified any legal issues that could possibly um, that could be present in their case, such as firm resettlement or any criminal issues. Um, and then we've confirmed their identities their household um, and the relationship of the individuals in their household. We've also asked clients to gather certain documents such as information that they will need to have prepared on their asylum application, any type of documents that um, they have in hand that are from their country that may support their claims such as police reports or affidavits. And we also prepare a pre-screening sheet, um, essentially a one-page summary that outlines their claim and their biographical information, including their household. And so during the clinic, um, next slide, please. And so during the clinic, each volunteer is going to receive a folder containing two copies of the limited scope of services. Um, one copy is for the client, another copy is for a file for the file, um, a volunteer confidentiality agreement, that pre-screening sheet that I just explained, instructions on how to move forward on the clinic day, um, what to do when you're ready for a supervisor, and where to send that application, and a checkout packet that it's essentially a know your rights packet with important information on their case um, that should be provided to the client. And we please ask, do not rely solely on our pre-screening sheet on that summary of the claim. Um, clients should still be um, screened a little more extensively for their asylum application. So we have already screened them for other types of relief. There is no need to enter that with them, um, but the client should be providing you more details on their asylum claim, why they fled the country, who harmed them, et cetera. And so NILAG will connect you with your client that day, give you the file. Um, you can introduce yourself. You should stress the so pro se nature of these services. Clients have already been informed that the type of um, assistance that they'll be provided is application assistance only, and you will, no one will be um, represented at the day of the clinic. Um, not in the application, not in court. So all clients should have a full understanding of this, but just remind them of that one more time. Um, and please avoid using legal terms of art such as pro se. Um, so we like to describe that as saying we're unable to represent you in this application or in court. That means that the only um, assistance that I'll be providing you today is assistance with preparing your asylum application. Um, and just give the applicant an overview of what you should expect during their time with you, the types of things that you'll be talking about, um, please have them review and sign both copies of the limited scope retainer and provide them one copy to them and one for the file. After that, you can begin working on the I-589. Um, that is the name of, oh, next slide, please. Um, that is the name of the form, the asylum application that, that we need to prepare that day. And please let a NILAG supervisor know in real time if you have any questions, do not wait for checkout. Um, and then once everything is complete, please let a NILAG supervisor know. We will come over and review everything um, that on the asylum application with the applicant, confirm all of the information is correct, and just go over the claim. We'll let you know if any changes need to be made. And once finalized, you can email that completed I-589, that completed asylum application, to pspp at nilag.org. Once we receive that um, I-589, we will print it. We'll then ask that the applicant sign all, cop, um, all pages of the asylum application. So specifically, there's three different possible pages for them to sign. That would be page nine, page 11, and page 12. Please make sure they sign um, the last two pages, pages 11 and 12, even if those pages are blank. Um, you will then give the client a copy of that checkout packet let them know how they can change, um, check their A number in the EYR ad, ad, automated case information, and you can give that folder back to NILAG staff once we're done. Um, so now I'll hand it back to Melissa, who will talk a little bit about some tips for completing Form I-589 during the clinic. 
So this is before the... Melissa um, continue, just wanted to let everybody know that the 589 form, it's on the chat as well as the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Wilma. Um, so this is the part of the training where I would suggest you take a moment and pull up the form because we're gonna go through, you can see this first slide. We're going to go through the form um, nitty gritty. Um, and these tips are really built on having filled this out many, many times, but also some of the questions that we get um, during the day of the during the day of the clinic. Um, well, now the boxes on the training are coming up again. I just want to make sure I can't. Oh, great, thank you. Um, okay, so you have the I five eighty nine pulled up. Take a look. Um, this is where you'll be spending most of the time with the client. And so um, let us just uh, let's just jump right in. And so the one the first thing that I would say is that we don't have it here, but we really should. You'll see at the very top of the very first page, it has this uh, box that says, check this box if you also want to apply for withholding of removal um, under apply for withholding removal under the Convention Against Torture. Please check that off. It is a, it is a little thing, but it's pretty important. Um, so just that's the first thing you should do as you're going um, as you're going through, you can see um, there, it, the most of the first couple of questions are uh, straightforward. If they don't have a social security number, if they don't have a USCIS number, that's fine, leave it blank. Question seven is the first one we wanna talk about a little bit. It says other names. Please, please, please ask specifically if they've ever used any other names, even if they have not used them legally. And so this obviously includes maiden names, other names that have been used in a formal way under the law, but it should also include stage names, um, any nicknames that they are known known by in the community. Um, it, it, as we'll keep talking about throughout the completion of the I-589, this form will be the first thing or one of the first things that the government will use in assessing the credibility of an asylum seeker. And so small differences between this form and testimony that may be given later may create huge problems for the perception of someone's um, credibility in their asylum claim. And so it's really important that this is very accurate um, and that you ask all the questions on the form, even though it may seem kind of straightforward. Um, so question eight, address. Um, the important question to ask about address is, can they get mail there? Um, this is, in, is particularly important given the housing instability that is faced by many of our clients and the fact that um, we now have a 30, 60 day rule for shelter. Um, and so really asking, is this the address that you can most uh, easily get mail at? Um, understanding that after we filed this application, the individual may get a receipt notice and other notices asking them to come and do fingerprinting. If they don't have a stable address, or if that address is not one where they can get their mail, um, they should uh, they should put in uh, the mailing address uh, below in the mailing address block. Um, for question nine, for gender, you should mark their preferred gender. Um, and it's worth noting that if you have a transgender client who has not yet legally changed their name, you unfortunately have to list their dead name, their legal name under complete name, but then you can list their preferred name under other names used. Sorry, we have a question here. If they don't have a stable address uh, where they can receive mail, so they should still put under address the address where they are living, but you will uh, where they're living, even if they can't receive mail. But you'll see under there, there's a mailing address block, and so that's the block you should use if somebody can't receive mail at the address that they are living at, but they have another address where they can receive mail. Hope that's helpful. Um, okay. Uh, marital status um, for question 11. Um, 
note that married only applies to legally binding marriages. Otherwise, they're single. And so if the individual is in a domestic uh, partnership that's not recognized by law, unfortunately, you still have to put single on there. Uh, if it is a religious marriage, again, that has not been recognized by law, it's still single. Okay, uh, moving on, information about applicants. Uh, for question 14 about present nationality, ask affirmatively whether individuals have nationality in another country. You must check if they have dual nationality or not. Um, if they have visas in other countries, they have status in other countries, no need to, to note that here, but it, you, you should ask affirmatively and don't assume that someone only has nationality in one country. Um, for race or ethnic group, um, many of the clients that we work with, particularly those from um, Central and South America, are uh, may be indigenous, and this may be um, a question that one has to ask specifically about whether or not um, an individual is a, a, a indigenous. Some ways of asking that also are um, maybe what languages their uh, family members spoke, their community members spoke, and if it's anything other than the dominant language, let's say Spanish, it would be worth talking to a NILAG person to try to flush that out to see if that um, is something we should make sure to mark and include because it may also affect their asylum claim if they are indeed indigenous. Uh, for question 18, um, as, as uh, Allison talked about before, we're asking you to affirmatively check the EOIR hotline. You can do it either by phone or online and the link is in the training and the phone numbers in the training. If they're in the EOIR system, meaning when you put in their alien number, it says, your name is this, you have a hearing date on this date, then you mark box B. If they have a charging document, the NTA that Allison went over before, but when you go into the EOIR system and there's no date, there's no time, you mark box A. This is really, um, this is an important point because many of the newly arrived immigrants are receiving notices to appear that look like they have an actual date and time. We refer them, we refer to them as ghost dates. And so you look at the NTA and it says show up to this address on this date. And it's very specific. But when you look in the EOIR system, it doesn't, it's not reflected there because it has not yet been registered with the court. For those people, even though they have an NTA that says you're in court, you're showing up on the state, you're still marking box A. Um, for question 20 to 22, these are all about their passport. ICE takes many, many passports at the border and that and the passport of those that you are seeing may be in custody with um, Customs and Border Patrol or ICE. If that is true um, and they don't know the number or the document numbers of their passport, which is fine, just write unknown in ICE custody in the box. Okay. Um, part two, A2 is about spouses and children. Um, this asks what seems to be a, a simple question, but can be a little tricky. Um, it asks, is your spouse or child to be included in this application? Now, the first question you have to ask is, is the person in the United States or not? If the person is not in the US, you skip the question, you leave it blank. And that is a little counterintuitive, so I'm gonna say it one more time. If the person, uh, if the spouse or child, even if they are legally their spouse or their child, if they're not in the United States, you leave that box blank. If the person, the spouse or the child is in the United States and they're in removal proceedings, so they are also in deportation proceedings, you mark yes. Uh, if the person who is applying, the person you're meeting with, is, uh, is in removal proceedings, uh, but the person, the spouse or the child is not, that happens sometimes when people get separated at the border, then you mark no. And, and if this is all confusing, it's okay. You don't have to remember all of it, just call one of us in. But it's enough to say here that this question of whether or not be, they will be included is a little tricky. 
Um, and if the child is over 21 or married, you have to put no. So just to review, if the person is not in the United States, you skip question. Uh, skip, skip the question and leave it blank. There's a question in the chat about do we leave it blank? Yes, you leave it truly blank. You don't do anything with it. You don't mark yes or no, you just leave it. If the person is in the United States, if the, uh, the, uh, the, the child or the spouse is in the United States and they're already in removal proceedings, you mark yes. If the person, the applicant, the asylum seeker is in removal proceedings, but the child or the spouse is not, you put no. And the reason you put no is the moment you put yes, that child or spouse gets put into removal proceedings with the applicant for asylum. And if the child that they want to, that they have is married or over one, you mark no, or over 21, you mark no. Okay, so who is it considered a child? Under immigration law, um, unmarried children who are under 21 years old, um, as well as stepchildren, um, where the marriage occurred before the child turned 18, okay? Um, all children should be listed here, even if they're not derivative. So even if they can't get asylum from their parent, even if they are over 21, even if they are married, they should be included here. They just cannot be included in the application. And what included in the application means it's the box checked, okay? Who should you not include on this application? You should not include individuals who are treated like children but have not been formally adopted or acknowledged as a biological child. And so we see this often where somebody might have raised another family member's child as their own for many years but never formally adopted them. Unfortunately, they cannot count um, as a child to be listed on an application for the purposes of asylum. Okay, part A3 is what immigration practitioners often refer to as page four. Um, when you look at this, you'll see that page four is really a list of employment, uh, uh, addresses, um, uh, biological information about parents' names. Most NILAG screened clients should come with a pre with pre-filled information for page four. This is part of our screening process because this is the part that can take the longest. People need to call relatives, they need to search things online, they need to um, look through their documents. So with any hope, the information that you will need to collect for this um, will be, uh, will already be pre-filled, or at least they'll have a piece of paper that you can enter into page four. Um, some things to note. First, please make sure uh, that the dates line up for their employment, their school, their address um, with their asylum narrative. And so you may have to go back and forth to take a look to, to, to make sure that they do generally line up. So for instance, if your applicant for asylum says that they moved around three times or five times to avoid persecution over the last five years, but they've listed only one address, you need to ask questions because you've now create, if you only put one address, you've now created an internal inconsistency in your asylum claim that can harm your, uh, the society. Or for example, if they said that they barely left their home and they lived in hiding for the last four months before um, coming to the United States, but they list their last job as in another third country um, up until the day they fled, it, you have to ask more questions and understand how the narrative that they're going to put forth in their asylum application later for their for why they're fearful lines up with the facts as you've lined them out in a, in their address and work history. Um, it's just worth notice no, noting that for address history, there's often no specific street numbers or house numbers. Or the alternative may happen that you may have an address that's very, very long, 
if they don't have specific street addresses or house numbers, that's fine. Fill in what the individual can um, recall or what um, makes sense in terms of addresses for where they were living. If the address is too long, you can you can say see addendum in the box and um, fill it out in one of the addenda in the back and you'll see um, at the very end of the application, there are pages for um, extra information. You just have to put in what number and what section you're putting your, you're filling it out for, and you'll just put your longer addresses there. Um, okay. Uh, employment history. Please include all employment history, even if they worked without authorization. Working without authorization is generally not an issue for an asylum application. However, um, giving untruthful information can be an issue. And so it's much more important to be truthful and straightforward about the fact that people are working even without authorization than um, trying to hide the fact that they're working um, without permission. And so sometimes asylum applicants are obviously hesitant to reveal that they're currently working because they think that it will negatively impact them or their case, or they may think that you'll think less than, less than them, right? Um, so you can just start by asking, are you currently working? And if you feel that they're hesitating, you can quickly and generally mention for the purpose of an asylum case, working without authorization is not generally an issue. And what's more important is to be forthcoming about the fact that you are working so that your application is truthful. Um, and that if they're working using false social security numbers where they know it has been taken from another person, that's really the only time it may be an issue. But that's the, that, that is actually the vast minority of people. It happens on uh, with it, that happens very rarely, and so if you're starting to sense some hesitation, um, you can just quickly explain. It's more important to be truthful in this, um, and important to to say that you're you're working, and could be detrimental to your application to lie. Um, for family history, you'll see that you have to put um, an individual's name as well as location, and sometimes. Uh, applicants are understandably worried about um, mentioning siblings or parents who may be here in the United States um, and are undocumented. Um, you can just explain that um, we don't we do have to list everyone, so we can't omit someone just because they might not have um, status in the United States. However, we can list a general location, right? So we don't have to put a specific address. So, for instance, just saying you know Boston, Massachusetts, or New York, New York is, is um, sufficient to list there. And as we were talking about before, any information that doesn't fit in this section, you can list in Supplement A, um, which is all the way at the end of the I-589. Um, okay. So for question, for part B, question uh, this information about the application. So this is where we get into the nitty gritty of their asylum claim. And uh, as we discussed in the at asylum, there are five protected grounds, and you'll see them here, right? Um, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, um, particular social group. Um, PSPP staff will have done a pre-screening and suggested some of the bases that we've identified, but there may be more. And so for question one, you should check off all the bases that it may apply. Because remember, it can be one or multiple. To be frank, most people have more than one. Um, in questions 1A and 1B, um, this is about past, past uh, harm and fear of future harm. I cannot stress this enough. Um, this is only a summary. Okay, and so you can start or end your answer here with, this is a summary. I will provide a more detailed statement in the future. You can put it at the very beginning or at the very end, but it needs to go in this box. Um, this box must provide enough information to articulate a claim for asylum, a basis, just a basis, and to identify the grounds that someone may be eligible for. 
However, here, please do not ask the client to go into extreme details about their past harm because we want to avoid unnecessary re-traumatization. There is no need to ask someone to recount their past persecution in great detail in order to fill out this application for asylum. And doing so will su subject that person to some really unnecessary re-traumatization, okay? Um, additionally, and importantly, the form does not require that level of detail. Um, and including too much detail in the form can create inconsistencies unnecessarily. Trauma, time, distance can make memories change. It doesn't make them any less truthful. But if they have a document that lists too many details, the effects of trauma and time um, may be such that when the application is finally heard before by an adjudicator, before a judge or an officer, the um, applicant for asylum may recount it slightly differently. And why that might be understandable, given all of the other factors that we've talked about, you may be setting them up for um, a, a negative credibility finding um, without uh, meaning to. And so what we say here is that this is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an art. You want to include enough details that it's clear why someone is seeking asylum, but you don't want to include so many details that you can create inconsistencies later. We would suggest that you just include the most serious events that are summarized briefly. I was arrested and detained and tortured for three days. I was uh, um, uh, held in custody for two weeks. And during that time, I was um, subjected to physical assault on a daily basis. Something very general, okay? Avoid specific details, no dates. January 23rd, 2023, do not put specific dates, right? Don't put in specific quantities. Um, you wanna keep everything very general so that they can actually add in more information um, at the time of their hearing when they're actually having their claim heard, okay? Um, the I-589 form is not the appropriate forum for ex an extremely detailed retelling of their persecution. That will be um, at the time of their hearing or their interview. At that time, they'll be asked for more questions about what happened to them, and they can fill in what they are describing in broad strokes in their I-589. For question B, um, it's just worth um, asking a little Talk, talked about, are there any other reasons that you might be afraid to go home to your own country? Um, you can also ask, um, what do you think will happen to you if you're forced to return home? And why do you believe that? To make sure you're really capturing all of the different bases that someone may be um, eligible for asylum and fearful of returning home. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison to keep going on the form. Uh, thank you so much. And just to summarize, um, as Melissa has been detailing, why is a summary important? Um, before an immigration judge or an asylum officer adjudicates the merits of an asylum application. So before that a decision maker goes over whether or not a client um, has faced past persecution or has a well-founded fear of future persecution based on a protected ground, they first determine their credibility. And if they determine that the client is not credible, their application will be denied before that adjudicator reaches the, uh, the merits of the application. But if that adjudicator determines that they are credible and they have corroborated their claim, they will then move forward to the next uh, stage of the analysis and determine whether or not they actually qualify for asylum under the INA. And so a summary is important for this determination of credibility because memory fails. Um, in all likelihood, this applicant will not be moving forward on the merits of their asylum application until years down the line. Very few individuals are currently getting um, calendared and docketed in a manner that is um, that would allow them to have an individual hearing within the next year or so. The vast majority are going to wait years before they can tell the details of their story. 
Um, and as we all know, trauma affects memory and it affects an individual's ability to detail their story in a chronological or a, a rational way to understand. And so that summary is extremely important because we want to set them up in the best possible way to not only apply for their asylum application timely, but to potentially obtain legal representation in the future. And if they're unable to obtain legal representation, we want to at least create a roadmap of a summary of their claim for that adjudicator. So that as soon as that decision maker looks at this application, they know more or less what type of claim this is and what they should be asking about. Um, and applicants are always allowed um, more time to provide additional information in the future, even if this is an affirmative or a defensive application. And so here is just uh, an example of, of the type of summary that we're really looking for here. Uh, this is a brief summary. I will provide a more de detailed statement in the future. I suffered several acts of physical and psychological violence and threats by the government at a protest because of my opposite, because of my opposition to the government. I feared for my life and fled my, fled my country. Um, that would be more for a political opposition claim for a domestic violence type of claim. We have, this is a brief summary. I'll provide a more detailed statement in the future. I suffered years of physical and psychological abuse by my husband in and out of our home because I believed that I belonged to him. And because of his abuse, I feared for my life and fled my country. Um, as you can see, there's no specific um, dates in any of these. Um, there's just more of a summary of what type of abuse that they suffered, where that abuse was, who did the harm. Um, you can certainly highlight any severe incidents here. Um, so for example, my husband would often beat me so badly that um, I had to go to the, the hospital to seek medical treatment on one particular occasion. And then you can detail maybe a very severe impactful incident that um, may grab the reader. Um, but otherwise, we want to avoid detailing the exact types of abuse that they suffered and want more of a summary. And so what type of information are we capturing in these sum summaries? It's the who, what, why, how, and where. Who perpetrated this harm? Was it the government? Was it the police? Was it a private actor? Was it her husband? What type of harm occurred? Was it threats? Were those threats oral? Were they written? Um, were they in person? Were they by phone? Um, was it physical violence, sexual violence, verbal violence? What exactly was the harm that happened and why? And that's going to the, the nexus, um, the on account of. That's where you're connecting the harm that they suffered to the protected ground. Um, so if we're using a political, um, a political opinion claim, so uh, that harm occurred due to their political activities. So because I engaged in these protests, I was arrested and tortured by the police. And how, what methods were used to harm them? Were they physically beaten with their hands? Were they beaten with their objects? Were they um, thrown in jail? What exactly was used to hurt them? And where did that general harm occur? Were they at home? Were they at a protest? Um, did the police go to their job? etc. All right, and as we move forward through the form, um, we can see on page six, question three, it's regarding memberships. And so this is just another opportunity to engage in additional advocacy on this form. So if you had a, a particular client who was part of a political party, you would want to list that, um, that political party here and those activities. Or if you have an indigenous client, you would want to list their ethnic group here or that they have family that is part of that ethnic group. Um, but this would also include more types of membership that are a little more non-traditional or wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily pop up in our heads as we're asking about um, memberships. For example, church memberships. So if your client is a member of the evangelical or the Christian church, that should be listed here and whether or not they continue to engage in those activities. If they belong to a church in their home country, I'd recommend asking if they or their family continue to attend a church here. And if so, which one? 
And for political party supporters and members, you can ask if they continue to support that party in any way since moving here. So for example, we've had clients who continue to engage in political activism after having moved to the United States through social media um, or through blogs. Um, and then the same thing with military or police service. If you have any clients who were part of the military, so we do sometimes see uh, asylum claims that are connected to having been part of the military, having refused to engage in orders that was essentially orders for the military to um, commit violence against protesters or other um, demographics of that country, and they refused and they quit the military and they are thus um, facing persecution as a result of this refusal and their ex service. You would definitely want to make sure that this question lists that military service or that police service in order to be consistent with their claim. Um, so as all of the other sections um, of this application, we always want to keep their claim in mind as we're filling this out. Um, and then on question four, it's essentially the same answer as question B about future harm, but in this question, you're uh, detailing it as a fear of torture. Um, so if they fear returning because the police will seriously harm them, you would want to say they fear re um, returning because the police could torture them. And as we continue on, on the next page, there's a question here, question one that asks if any family members have applied for asylum. Some individuals may have family members who are already here, who have may have their asylum pending, or if that asylum has been granted. And if that is the case, you want to indicate yes, list their family members' names and their A numbers. If that individual does not have their A number on hand and has no way to verify that A number, um, then you can just say a number unknown. And then questions 2A and 2B, these questions are asking for them the firm resettlement issue that Melissa detailed earlier in this presentation. So all of our applicants um, through Pro Se Plus Project, the vast majority have traveled through other countries. And so you want to ask them which countries they have traveled through how long were they present in those countries? And what was their immigration status in that country? Um, it's possible that a client may be a citizen of one country that does not require a visa to enter another and all they need to present is their passport. Um, so for example, uh, Ecuadorian citizens do not need a visa to enter Colombia. So if you have an Ecuadorian client who traveled through Colombia to enter the United States, you would just want to ask them, what did you present at the airport? What did you present to a government official? And if they say their passport, you would just want to confirm, was there any visa inside that passport? Um, and if they say no, then you can con confirm that it was um, an entry that was temporary visa status um, that allowed them to just visit that country for business or for pleasure. Um, and if they did have a visa in their passport, you would want to ask them, do you have a copy of that visa? Most of our applicants do not have their passports in hand. And that is because when they were detained at the border, ICE or CBP, they have retained their passports. So their passports are in custody with an immigration agency. However, some of them have copies of their passports and copies or photos of the visas that were in their passport. And so if that is the case, you can simply look at that um, copy or picture, confirm what type of status that was. If they do not have that copy, you may have to do a little digging. Um, you may have to ask them how long did that visa say that you were allowed to remain in that country? Do you have any family members that traveled with you who maybe remember what type of visa that was? And if they did have any type of immigration status, you would want to explain what type of issues they had in that country or if they felt unsafe. And that is, as Melissa had previously detailed, there are certain exceptions to get to overcome the firm resettlement bar. Um, and so you would want to try to go to those, um, those exceptions. So you would want to try to discuss why those, uh, why that environment was too restrictive, why the conditions in that country were too restrictive for them to be able to live there, or why they lack community ties in that country.
Once, once you've gotten through pages one through eight and used any addendums for additional pages, you would just email a copy of that completed application to pspp at nybag.org, that email that was previously mentioned. We also have that email contained in the instructions of the folder. Um, so there's no need to memorize that email address. But once completed and a supervisor has reviewed that application and it is final, um, we will then print a copy of that I-589 for the applicant to sign. And they would sign in Part D and you as the preparer would sign in Part E. NILAG will be filing these applications with Immigration Court or with USCIS. Um, so there, you should not be checking that G28 box um, because you do not represent them. However, please include your New York State bar number as the preparer where it um, asks for that at the bottom of the page. If, um, if a client is in Immigration Court, NILAG will also be including something called EOIR 61, which is essentially a form by the Immigration Court confirming that you're providing pro se services and not representing them. Um, the client should also sign all addendum pages, even if blank. So they should sign in total three pages, pages 9, 11, and 12. Okay, and after, once everything is signed, um, NILAC takes care of all of the follow-up after the clinic. So as I was previously mentioning, if the applicant is in immigration court, we will be filing our E61s in support of the case with our EOIR number and our bar number, confirming that we've reviewed this application and it was drafted under our supervision. Um, we will be providing the applicant a copy with um, a copy of the 589. So if it is a USCIS and affirmative filing, we will also be providing them um, proof of mailing. So we'd be providing them the USPS tracking number. If it is an EOIR filing in New York, um, so an immigration court filing in New York, we will be physically going to the immigration court and filing it in person. So we will have a stamped copy that we'll be mailing to the applicant. If it is a court filing outside of New York, we will be mailing that application to the proper, um, to the proper uh, venue. Not all immigration courts stamp our cover sheet and mail it back. So we may or may not have a stamped copy for the applicant, but they will be provided a copy of the USPS tracking number to that immigration court. Um, and that date of filing is important. Um, so not only once they have proof of their filing, not only are they um, eligible for employment authorization, counting 150 days after they have filed their application, but they are also called um, pro-call. So that is person residing under color of law. So they are now pro-call eligible for New York State benefits. And so once they have that proof of filing, they can then apply for Medicaid health insurance, and they can also apply for safety net assistance, which is cash assistance. And NILAC will be providing um, clients a copy of all of this. So proof of that yeah, the application was filed and um, the USPS tracking number, which they can then take to HRA and apply for those public benefits. And so just to summarize um, everything, once the application is filed, the applicant will be receiving um, a copy of that filing from us and that tracking number. They will then receive from USCIS, regardless if this is defensive or affirmative, USCIS will mail them a receipt notice confirming that that application has been received and is pending. And then they will get a fingerprint appointment, a biometrics appointment. Um, affirmative filings are currently taking anywhere between one to two months for that paperwork. Defensive filings does take longer. So USCIS is mailing defensive uh, receipt notices and biometrics appointment anywhere between three up to six, sometimes seven months after that has actually been filed with immigration court. Once they've received that paperwork and done that biometrics notice, the next step is to wait and continue to wait for quite some time. And eventually they will be scheduled with either an appointment before the asylum office or an individual hearing before the immigration judge where their, um, where their applications will be adjudicated. And they will have plenty of opportunity while that application is pending in order to supplement and present more evidence. Um, at the asylum office, an asylum officer conducts the interview, 
um, those asylum interviews are non-adversarial, which is different from immigration court, where there is an ICE off, um, attorney present and has the opportunity to cross-examine them. And just remember that those with NTAs that have been docketed with an immigration court um, will be getting this trial, and those who do not have NTAs issued will be getting an interview with the asylum office. So defensive gets a trial, and affirmative gets that interview. Um, but regardless, under either application, the applicant will have opportunity to present more evidence, such as a written detailed statement about their claim, um, country conditions, any reports from that country about the conditions, uh, proof from their home country of available medical records from when they went to the hospital, police reports, affidavits from family and friends. And at the asylum office, there is a possibility that the asylum officer will adjudicate the asylum application and approve it. If they do not approve it, that is not a denial. The case will simply be referred to immigration court where the applicant has another opportunity um, to possibly win their asylum application in front of the immigration judge. And immigration court, um, if that application is denied by an immigration judge, that applicant has the right to appeal to the BIA, the Board of Administri Administri Admin Immigration Appeals, um, which is the appeals body for immigration court. And I'm still seeing that little box on my screen, but at this point we're, um, we're at the end. And so I would just like to open it up to the group if anyone has any questions for us. Um, I don't know if there are any questions um, on the chat. We can take a look. Um, I had a question, <laughs> just in case it get asked at the clinic. Um, it's about the asylum. There's a question about who else in your family um, completed an application um for asylum and you say that you need to list those uh, family members who will be considered a family member brothers sisters or a who that's a that's a great question and to answer it should be um any uh family member that could potentially have an impact on the asylum applicant's claim quite honestly and so i would not limit it to family members who could potentially be a derivative on their application or for whom they could be a derivative on their application. If you have a brother or a sister, an uncle, an aunt, a cousin, any individual who may have a similar asylum claim as you or as that applicant, then you should be listing their name here. The status of that asylum application, whether it is pending, whether it has been approved, and their A number if known. Um, and Melissa, please, um, if you have anything else to add. No, I have nothing to add. Um, it, and I think Allison's totally right. It, and the, the reason for that is because if you're, if this individual ends up in court, um, it's the practice of the government to pull the files of those who might have uh, associated claims to look at them. And so you do want to be more broad in this than narrow. Um, I see in the chat, there's a really good question about um, whether the practice is still to include an A as much as possible. Um, this is a this is a was definitely something we were doing for many years because we were getting output. Both Allison and I are smiling because we have we have small traumas from this time. But um, the application used it used to be such that it, they would be rejected if they didn't have every single box filled out with an NA. Um, that's no longer the practice, thankfully. Um, and so it's not necessary to fill in every single box with an answer. You can leave some blank where it's not applicable. Um, another question is whether they'll be working with a partner in a group or solo. My understanding is that there will be a translator working with you um, at the very least, but I, I feel like I'm, Allison, you'll know this better than I will.
Um, yes, I think that everyone will be either working together with a group, with a partner, um, but everyone will be having an interpreter unless that attorney speaks the language of, of the applicant that day. So for example, we do have a number of applicants who speak French. Um, and so if we have the pairs who do speak French, then um, they would not need an interpreter or that attorney can be an interpreter for, for their partner. Um, if there's any need for, for that interpretation, then that interpreter will be present. Okay, thank you so much. I don't know if there's any other questions before we wrap up, but thank you so much, Melissa, Allison, Wilma. That was fantastic and very, very helpful. And we're really excited for the clinic to be held. Next, uh, I believe, yeah, it's coming up November 16th. So we're definitely excited about that. Um, for everyone at Latham, um, the CM is the same as last time. And I'll put, put it in the chat just so we can all have it. Um, and then the CLE code is 4628798. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, thank you so, so much. And we really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to the clinic. Thank you to everyone and for your support to New York City Asylum Seekers. And I hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.